Lycon Gaming is awesome, and the Mr. FPGA offers many ways to enjoy Lycon games. Not too long ago, the Mr. FPGA project officially added support for the GunCon 2 and GunCon 3, thanks to work done by Nolan Nicholson. These two peripherals allow you to use a single gun for all cores that support light gun gaming. It's much more convenient than using the snack method, where you would have to use each core's original light gun on the console it's implementing. And snack only lets you use light guns with a CRT. The GunCon 2 was made for the PlayStation 2 and only works with CRT TVs. The GunCon 3, however, was made for the PlayStation 3 and was made to work with modern flat panel displays. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up a GunCon 3. Also, if you don't have the emitters for the GunCon, I will show you how to make your own. These emitters can be really expensive, but making your own is a much cheaper alternative. Unfortunately, a remote sensor bar will not work. You need to use IR LEDs at a specific wavelength for this to work. Since I personally do not have the official IR emitters that come with the GunCon 3, I'm first going to show you how to create your own. This is thanks to work done by A.W. Bacon on the Mr. FPGA Discord. He also runs the Video Game Esoterica YouTube channel, so check it out for more Mr. FPGA and other retro gaming related content. Also, there is work being done that will help you have PCBs made using freely available Gerber files. This will make the creation of do-yourself emitters easier and more presentable. But the method I'm going to show you now is a DIY solution. So there are a couple of ways you can create the emitters. You can solder the components together, or you can use a breadboard. I first created the emitters using breadboards because it was much quicker, but this leaves you with a more cumbersome and less presentable setup. If you also want to test this out using breadboards first, then check out the description for the Tinkercad files I made to help you build them. So to build the emitters without a breadboard, you'll first need some components. I'll provide Amazon affiliate links in the description to the components I use. And I'll also put in there some AliExpress links to some cheaper versions. First, you'll need six 850 nanometer IR LED emitters. You'll also need two 20 ohm resistors. A spare USB-A cable that you don't mind cutting. We will need to expose the red and black wires inside of it. If you don't have any spares, you can purchase some pre-cut cables. I'll also provide links to those. You'll need to make sure you have plenty of extra wiring. The amount will depend on the size of your television and length you may want to extend a USB cable. I use 22 gauge wires I have on the spindle. Other gauge wires should also work, but this is what I have on hand. You'll also need to know how to solder. You might be able to get away with tying cables together, but soldering provides a more secure connection. So along with those items, you also need any tools to help you perform the emitter assembly. Tools like a soldering iron, solder tape, wire strippers, etc. Okay, so let's assume you have all the parts you needed. Now let's begin the assembly. We want to first solder the two sets of emitters. Here is the first set of three emitters. You can see that each of them has two legs, one positive and one negative. The longer leg is the positive and the shorter leg is the negative. I'm going to solder these legs together in series. What this means is connecting the legs together in this order and orientation you see here. So I'll connect this negative leg to this positive leg and this negative leg to this positive leg. Also on the IR emitter to the right, I will be connecting one of the 20 ohm resistors to the emitter's positive leg. Here's a Tinkercad diagram on how they will be connected. To give myself a little more flexibility in moving these LEDs, instead of soldering the LED legs to each other, I'm going to use these wires to give me more length. So I'm first going to solder this wire to the negative leg of the right LED. That is its shorter leg which I put on the left side. I tape the wires and LEDs down so they won't move while I'm soldering. I could have made things easier by stripping more of the cables to expose more of the internal wires and then tying them to the LEDs before soldering. Now, the other side of the cable, I will solder it to the positive leg of the middle LED. Then I'll take the second wire I have and solder the middle and left LEDs together, starting with the negative leg of the middle LED.
and then solder the other side of the wire to the positive leg of the right LED. So now I have the LEDs connected in series. Now I'm going to solder a 20 ohm resistor to the positive leg of the right LED. This is when I figured out I could tie things together first before soldering. The LED and resistors are tied together, so I'll solder them now. So this is one set of the LEDs prepared. You need to repeat the same process of soldering another set of three LEDs with a resistor. I'm going to skip showing you how to do the second set because it's the exact same process I showed you. So now that we have two sets of IR LEDs emitters connected in series, I'm now going to take one of the sets of LEDs and solder the resistor to the red positive wire of my USB cable. I don't want to connect my USB cable directly to the LED because I don't think it's long enough. You may have a USB cable that's long enough, but what I'm going to do to extend the label is to go to my cable spinder and grab some more cable. It's important to use the same color cables as the ones on the USB cable. It helps you know what's positive and negative. I'll use this reddish slash orange wire to connect to the red wire on the USB cable. So I'll now solder this cable I got from my spindle to the resistor. Here's how this setup looks like in Tinkercad. And now here's that cable soldered. I forgot to hit the record button, so I didn't catch it. Here you can see both sets of LEDs with one having a wire soldered to the 20 ohm resistor. If you look at my Tinkercad diagram, you can see that this positive wire also attaches to the 20 ohm resistor of the other LED set. So I will solder another red wire to the two resistors. These IR LEDs will have to sit on each end of my TV. To get a good measurement of the length I need, I went to my spindle and cut off a wire that's about the length of my TV so I have enough room. I took a new red wire and tied it to the resistor that the other red wire is tied to, and then soldered them. After that soldered, I'll take the other side of the new wire and solder it to the other resistor of the second LED set. So let's see where I'm at. Here are the two sets of LEDs wired on the positive side. And here's how things look so far in a diagram. Now I want to take a cable to wire the negative LEDs together. This is how the connected negative LEDs look like in Tinkercad. I will also have to measure these about the length of my television. Since these will be attached to the negative LED legs, I'm going to be using a black wire. So now it's time to solder a negative leg to the black wire. Then take the other side of the black wire and solder it to the other negative leg on the other LED set. So for the next step, we're going to take the LED set with only one wire soldered to the resistor and solder a new black wire to the same LED leg that already has a black wire. Here's how the connection looks on Tinkercad. So I'm almost done here. I can solder the USB cable to this, but before I do that, I'm going to protect the signaling and also organize things a bit better by using tape. I'm going to use electrical tape on each leg of the LEDs to prevent them from touching each other. And on top of that, I'm going to tape things together so there isn't a mess of wires everywhere. So here are how things look like before I solder the USB cable. Each set of LEDs will be placed on top of one corner of my television. The final step is to solder these two wires to the USB cable. This is why it's important to color code the cables. I now know that I have to solder this black wire to the black wire on the USB cable. 
and the orange slash red wire to the red wire on the USB cable. So let me strip these wires. Then I'll solder. The USB cable is soldered. Now let me just wrap some electrical tape around them so they don't touch anything. So the setup is now ready to be used. Here is the full Tinkercad diagram. I'll plug in the USB end to a USB adapter I have lying around. But on the Mr. FPGA Discord, people are plugging them in directly to their television's USB port. If I aim the LEDs to the camera, you can see that they light up with a purplish color. This means that the emitters are working. You won't be able to see this purple light. Cameras do a better job of picking up IR light. But with your actual eyes, you should be able to see a faint red light coming out. Now if I unplug the USB cable, the purple light should disappear. And it does. I'm done building, so now it's time to put these emitters on my television and configure the Mr. FPGA to play some light gun games. Place the emitters on top of your television on the corners of the 4x3 screen space that games appear on. I'm using some tape so they stay put on the television. Make sure the emitters are facing straight. The emitters can work further apart, but that means you'll have to stand further away from the television so the gun con can properly see the emitters. It all depends on the size of your television. You can always play around with the placement. To me, it didn't matter how the emitters were arranged as long as they were all looking straight ahead. My TV is 60 inches and to me, it had to be a minimum of around 6 feet back from the television for the emitters to work best. Once the emitters are in place, just plug in the USB cable to a power adapter or to your television's USB port. After the emitters are in place, Plug in the GunCon 3's USB cable to your mister. This mister setup is in a Mini ITX case using Def's Mods Ironclad Plus Mini ITX IO board. If you want more information about this IO board, check out my video going over it. So the controller is plugged in. Now let's configure it. A keyboard will be required for this. Boot up the mister and go to the Define Joystick Buttons menu and assign each GunCon 3 button to whatever you want. I assign the D-pad buttons to joystick A on the GunCon 3. Then I assign A and B to B1 and B2 on the GunCon 3. I skip the rest of the buttons because a real GunCon 1 only had 3 buttons. You skip buttons by hitting space on your keyboard. I also like to set the menu button to another free button on the GunCon 3 so I can easily load up the menu to load another light gun game. And to navigate the menus more easily with the GunCon, I set menu OK to the gun's trigger, and menu back to button B2. Skip the rest and you're done. Once you have configured the GunCon 3's buttons configuration on the main Mr. Software, let's now configure the buttons on the gun for the core we want to play. Let's configure the PlayStation core. To configure other cores, check out my video on configuring a Wiimote as a light gun. Core button configuration will be exactly the same with the GunCon. Go to the PlayStation Core and go to the Define PSX Buttons option. I'll move the GunCon joystick to the right so I can start defining buttons. A real GunCon 1 only has 3 buttons, a trigger and 2 side buttons labeled A and B. You only have to map these 3 buttons. Skip buttons with a space bar on your keyboard until you reach Circle. Circle is what's used for the trigger, so press the trigger on your GunCon 3 to assign it. The cross button maps to the B button on an original GunCon 1. I set it to B2 on the GunCon 3. Skip the rest of the buttons until you reach Start which maps to A on an original GunCon 1. I set this to B1 on the GunCon 3. Now skip the rest of the buttons. Select No when asked to set up alternate buttons and then save your settings so you don't have to do this again the next time you load the core. If you don't like my mappings, then you can always remap them as you see fit. Now it's time to calibrate the GunCon 3. First, let's make sure the pause when OSD open option is enabled. You'll see why soon. Bring up the Mr. menu, 
scroll down to the miscellaneous, then make sure pause when OSD open is on. Leave this menu and reset the core. As the BIOS boots up, bring up the Mr. menu while the white background is still showing. If you miss it, just reset the core again until you get a white background with the core's menu open. If the pause when OSD open setting was off, then the BIOS screen will keep going when bringing up the core's menu. We want this white screen area to be paused. Now, bring up the calibration menu by hitting F10 on your keyboard. You'll see this new screen with four numbers. The top number has arrows on it. What this means is to point the gun to the top middle of the screen and hit the trigger button. Then the arrows move to the bottom number. Point the gun to the bottom middle of the screen and hit the trigger. Now the arrows move to the left number. Here's where the white background comes in handy. You do not want to point the gun all the way to the left edge of your TV screen. You want to point the gun to the left middle edge of the white background. We are calibrating to the 4x3 area of the core, not the TV 16x9 area. I hit the trigger and then do the same for the right side of the screen. After hitting the trigger for the right side number, the core will automatically resume and we're done with calibration. The last thing you need to do is to enable the light gun support in the core. To do that, open up the PlayStation's core menu and scroll down to pad 1. Set it to either gun con or justifier. Not all games support the gun con, some work exclusively with the justifier. If a game doesn't work, then switch the type of gun here. I find gun con mode to give me much more reliable results, whereas justifier mode was pretty buggy. You can save your settings so the core remembers to use the gun con or justifier the next time you load it, but then you will have to change your regular PlayStation pad for non light gun games. Here are some things to know about playing with the gun con 3. In my experience, where you calibrate should be where you play from. Playing from a different area will affect the accuracy. Again, the size of your television will affect the distance you can play from. The bigger the television, the further back you have to stand so the gun con can properly see the emitters. Also, I experienced that using smaller televisions or computer monitors give you better accuracy. The further to the side edges you aim on a big screen TV, the less accurate it gets. The accuracy is still a hell of a lot better than what you get with a Wiimote. At least with the GunCon 3, the aiming will be in the general area of where you aim. But with a Wiimote, most of the time the aim is way off. With the GunCon 3, games that you have to shoot off screen to reload are very finicky. Some don't work at all for reloading, and some will work some of the time. Okay, with that out the way, it's time for the fun part. I'm first going to test some PlayStation games, and then I'll test some other cores. I'll first start off with some games I tried in GunCon mode. Later, I'll show you Justifier games. Here's Elemental Gear Bolt, and this game works perfectly. A game I highly recommend playing on a Mister. Gunfighter is another game that works with no issues and is also highly recommended. Maximum Force worked great after calibrating it in game. As long as you are properly calibrated and standing at a good distance, you will have no issue. But if not, you will have some major problems trying to reload by aiming off screen. You can also notice that I started to lose my calibration. To get more comfortable filming, I moved things around in my living room, which caused the aiming to be off. Of course, I had to try out some Namco light gun games. The Point Blank series of games is some of the most fun you can have with a light gun. It consists of simple mini games where you have to achieve objectives. You really need to play these games. And I also tried Time Crisis, and it also works great.
I gave Revolution X a go, but I found out the hard way that I did not have light gun support. I tried using mouse mode, but that didn't work either. Now onto some justifier tests and show you some of the issues I experienced. Since the core is always being updated, these issues might be fixed in the future. I'll start with Area 51. This game requires a justifier setting. However, aiming even after calibrating within the game itself was just off. Look at the crosshair and see where the shots are landing. It's pretty unplayable. I also wasn't able to reload reliably. I experienced the same exact issues with Die Hard Trilogy as I did with Area 51. The aiming was way off and I didn't find any in-game calibration tool, but I did try to recalibrate in the Mr. UI and that still didn't help. Another issue with this game is that reloading was difficult to pull off. Sometimes it only worked if I aimed towards the bottom right of my screen, but couldn't consistently figure out exactly where. Other times it worked reliably. but. I did have to make sure that I don't move the gun con off screen too quickly or else the crosshair will still be in game. <laughs> Lethal Enforcers is another game that requires a justifier. Initially the aim was off, just like the previous games. But when I use the in-game calibration tool, it fixes the aiming issue. But I still get the same reload issues as Die Hard Trilogy, but worse in that I cannot reload at all. I tried to do the Mr. Calibration again, this time using the size of my TV screen, but that just messed up the aiming. As you can see, justifier support with the gun con is buggy and not a good experience. But please try it out yourself. I would love to know if the setup works better for you. For other cores like the NES and Genesis cores, they all worked fine, but I did have to recalibrate each new core in the Mr. Calibration tool, but only had to do it once for each core. Each core needed its own calibration that is done with a core open. Bringing up the calibration screen when no core is loaded will not work. So I must say that I'm really happy with the results. The GunCon 3, while it's not super accurate, it is accurate enough to make it an enjoyable experience as long as you get the calibration done right. Before, to play on my flat panel TV, I used to use a Wiimote and it wasn't accurate at all and no amount of calibration would improve it. If you have a CRT, it is also possible to use a GunCon 2 and GunCon 3 at the same time for two player gaming or gaming John Woo style. So, Overall, I'm excited that I have a good solution for playing light gun games without a CRT and it's great for those wanting to save money and don't have the IR emitters. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and if you want to see more content like this, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you can get notified of future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll speak to you next time.